Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tracy Cutler. I work with the Community Foundation. I'm just going to do a quick welcome as we get started. And I want to thank you for being here today. Um, everyone is welcome. You know, everyone in this room today comes to this session with different lived experience and perspective. And today we're looking forward to hearing some big ideas from today. And I just want to say, you know, you might hear things today that you agree with 100% that make you think um, or that you disagree with. And that's okay. We invite you to stay with this conversation and continue to ask questions. I just wanna reinforce that everyone is welcome here today. Um, today's a chance to continue uh, building a shared language and understanding of how racism and oppression impacts our society and our work. This might be some of the most important work of our time and we really need each other. So we're glad to have Tanae here today. Tanae Lynn Harris is the founder and principal strategist of Tenacity Consulting. As you might have seen in her bio, she worked exclusively with, um, with, she works as a social impact strategist, a facilitator, an organizer. She's worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and she's leveraged legal support in Ferguson during the uprising. Having grown up in Lancaster, Tanae has deep um, personal understanding of this community, and she really can offer us a, a unique perspective. You know, we know at the Community Foundation, we still have a lot to learn. And our team and our board has just actually started our own internal learning journey with Tanae that is going to last through the next 12 months. As we move into the new year, we'll be sharing some of the things we're reading and learning, um, and we hope that might help inspire your personal journey or the journey of your organization at the same time. I will speak from my personal experience and say, I know I still have a lot to learn. Um, through Tanae and through others, I've heard some things that make me stop and think, question my own privilege and my own perspective. And while it's uncomfortable, I've also found that it's okay. And I, I sit with things and I think about them. And over time, my new knowledge is shifting my understanding, it's shifting some of my actions. So, um, you know, I hope this might be true for you too. I was on a call yesterday about this topic. And, you know, one of the big takeaways is that the opportunity to affect um, systemic change is really going to start at the local level. And we all play different roles and we use our resources and our power in lots of different ways across this community. And my hope is that together we can support each other, we can sit with the discomfort, we can stay with the conversation and learn from experts and from each other and use this time as a real crucible for change in our community. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for working um, together to be part of the solution. We're really glad you're here and I'm happy to turn it over to Tanae. Thank you, Tracy. Hey, everybody. All right. So a few things for some of you who may have joined um, post some of the stuff I was putting in the chat box, please feel free to use your camera. Um, and if you could, please stay muted and uh, feel free to use the chat box. Um, there will be a time where we'll be unmuted and we'll be discussing. And although I'm asking you to be muted, that doesn't mean that you do not have a voice that I do not want to hear. It's just that we can allow for other folks to hear as well. Um, if you need uh, closed captioning, there is a live transcript. So you should see at the bottom of the screen, and then you can click on um, closed captioning option that works best for you. Um, we do apologize. Currently, we do not have someone who can do sign language, but definitely in the future, as we're working to, towards being uh, more uh, intentional and inclusive, um, uh, we need to, you know, think through those things more deeply and intentionally. And so I welcome you all. And also, as you all know, in the midst of Corona virus, COVID-19, we all had to shift to being virtual. And so sometimes technology isn't always on our side, but we will collectively work together um, to make it all happen. All right, if you give me a second to share my screen. <clears throat> All 
All right, can you all see my screen? Okay, great. All right. Um, and while I'm presenting, I'll try my best to follow along in the chat box. <clears throat> and there'll be moments that will kind of go back and forth. Um, and so welcome to Building Beloved Community through Collective Courage. Um, this is the last LEAP session with Lancaster County Community Foundation. Um, and again, I'm extremely excited to be here with you all. And so as we are setting intentions and grounding ourselves, um, I ask or that we collectively ask that we all listen reflectively and that we attempt to affirm, repeat, and to understand and that we speak intentionally and that we start with, that you start with you, the I, um, using words like I need clarity or I believe um, and to invite that clarity in that we listen effectively, um, understand that it's our point of view and why it's our point of view, and that we also seek objectivity and that we also recognize the subjectivity. And to remember to get what it is that you need. This work uh, manifests itself with on personal, interpersonal, structural, and institutional. And that even if you are showing up as an organization, um, that you remember to, to work on you and do the work for yourself first. That Automatically, this is a safe space, but most importantly, this is a brave and a bold space. Um, in order to really create safe space, we have to be both brave and bold. And that we have to understand that there is a difference between our intent and our impact. So my intent might not be to cause harm, but my impact may be that I did. And so we have to wrestle with the in-between. What is it that had happened? And we have to recognize it and we have to work through it. And that we always remember to challenge systems and not individuals because that allows us to get to root causes and that we all remember to breathe. Um, if some of you have not, I highly recommend the work of Adrienne Marie Brown. What I also appreciate about Adrienne is that she's very intentional of acknowledging that the work that she does isn't just hers alone, that this comes from being in community and working interdependently with other folks. And so these theories are not hers alone, but they're the collective that she has put pen to paper. And so when she's using emergent strategy, she says to remember that small is good and small is all. The large is a reflection of the small. And that change is constant, to be like water, to be ever flowing. There is always enough time for the right work and there is a conversation in the room that only these people in this moment can have, and we have to find it. There's never, we're never a failure, and that there's always a lesson, and that we trust the people. And if you trust the people, they become trustworthy. That we move at the speed of trust, focus on critical connection more than critical mass, and build the resilience by building the relationships. And that there's less prep and more presence, and remember that what you pay attention to grows. Grace Lee Boggs said, you cannot change any society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. And so one of the things that we have to work on uh, doing and delving deeper and being intentional about is that we have, to, we have to get to the point of getting honest and going beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so our intentions uh, are are to create levels of change and transformation within our organization. But we have to acknowledge that at this point in this critical time, we have to get beyond just the numbers. And so we have to ask the questions on what in the ways is diversity, equity, and inclusion situated within the dominant culture. And so we're asking folks to be more diverse in comparison to what? We're asking to shift numbers into what white dominant organizations, white dominant institutions. We're asking folks to be equitable, but we're also not asking who gets to determine what is equitable within those organizations and those institutions. And then we're asking folks to be inclusive 
in within those organizations that are situated within what the white dominant culture, the white dominant framework, practices and procedures. And so we have to delve way deeper into just simply saying, hey, we all want the intention of DEI. DEI is a good entry point, but it should not be our ultimate end goal. And so here we will look at the cycle of socialization, uh, which was developed by uh, Bobby Haro. And so what you'll see here is at the core, Bobby Haro mentions that there's fear, there's ignorance, there's confusion, insecurity. And, and also let me say, the reason why we're talking about socialization is because all of us within a society in which we have been cultivated in, we have all been socialized to uphold harm and oppression. And so it's for all of us to do the work to unlearn, relearn, and learn new ways of being and becoming. And so Dr. Bari Haro says that <clears throat> we have the core, the center, which is the fear, the ignorance, the confusion, and the insecurity. And we go to the beginning. And it says that we're born into it, the world with mechanics in place, no blame, no consciousness, no guilt, no choice, limited information, no information, misinformation, biases, stereotypes, prejudices, history, habit, and tradition. Then our first socialization is that we're socialized and we're taught on a personal level by our parents, relatives, teachers, people we love and trust, shapers of expectation, norms, values, roles, rules, models of ways to be and sources of dreams. And then we go into reinforce and we're bombarded with messages from our institutions, our churches. Uh, and I'll also add in there, we, synagogues, any place of faith, um, schools, television, legal system, mental health, business, medicine, culture, practices, song lyrics, language, media, patterns of thought. And this all happens on unconscious and un, on conscious and unconscious levels. And that it's reinforced and it's sanctioned, it's stigmatized, there's rewards and punishments for it, there's privilege, there's persecution, there's discrimination, and there's empowerment, which results in dissonance, silence, anger, dehumanization, guilt, collusion, ignorance, self-hatred, stress, lack of reality, horizontal violence, which is intercultural violence amongst your peers, inconsistency, violence, crime, internalization of patterns of power. And so here we have the choice to make the actions of either we change, we raise our consciousness, we interrupt, we educate, we take a stand, we question, and we refrain, or we do nothing and we don't make waves and we promote the status quo. And so it's for all of us to take a moment to just look at the cycle of socialization and think through the ways and how this has manifested uh, within our own uh, lives. And please feel free to use the chat um, if you would like to share with the group when you think about the ways and how you've been socialized. I'll give us a minute to do that. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie says that private school upbringing that promotes the status quo and experience, education and consumer norms from Tracy, Kathy, magazines and television showing white men in power and few people of color as beauty roles or lead roles. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. And so it's just important for us to acknowledge that we all, and I'll just reiterate this, that we all have been socialized unconsciously and consciously, and that it's for all of us, again, to do the work of decolonizing, of doing the work um, uh, of being less oppressive and thinking through, even if it were places and spaces um, that we love uh, within our own families, the way and how even our families might perpetuate harm to other family members, and for us to do that work, to learn, relearn, and unlearn. Um, thank you, Allison, Media and Education, 
And then Kevin says, uh, he's been socialized to presume, as a black man, I've been socialized to presume that there's a common version of blackness, but unique versions of whiteness. Even today as a board member, I'm often asked to speak on the perspective of black folk as if I can speak on behalf of all of them, even when nobody asks white board members the same. Mm, thank you, Kevin. And Kim has said family, uh, this function gets repeat, this junction gets repeated. Thank you, thank you. And you all can continue to share in the chat box um, um, along this time together. And so I really would like for us to cultivate a shared language and we're going to get to the reasoning why. Well, I will say this, it's important for all of us to have a shared language and we can always continue to delve deeper and find definitions and um, have a deeper analysis and understanding. Um, but a lot of times we use a lot of words without any real meaning behind it or we say the words without any real intention, or use words without having created a level of accountability. And we do that by just simply saying, I'm going to become more equitable. Or what does that mean? How are you going to actualize that? What is it that you're actually going to do? And how are you going to cultivate the deep understanding so that you do not perpetuate the harm? And so this is why shared language is important. And so we have anti-blackness, which uh, the Council for uh, Democratizing Education defines anti-blackness as being a two-port formation that both voids blackness of value while systemically marginalizing black people and their issues. The first form of anti-blackness is overt racism. Beneath this anti-black racism is a covert structural and systemic racism, which categorically predetermines the socioeconomic status of blacks in this country. The structure is held in place by anti-Black policies, institutions, and ideologies. The second form of anti-Blackness is the unethical disregard for anti-Black institutions and policies. This disregard is a product of class, race, and or gender privilege certain individuals experience due to anti-Black institutions and policies. This form of anti-Blackness is protected by the first form of overt racism. And so a lot of us have been talking about what does it mean to be anti-racist or we've been saying that we're doing anti-racism work. Um, and so anti-racism is defined as the work of actively opposing racism by advocating for changes in political, economic, and social life. Anti-racism tends to be an individualized approach and set up in opposition to individual racist behaviors and impact. Accountability. And I um, also, this will be sent out to you all. I don't mind uh, sharing the slides. You all will have this as well. Accountability in the context of racial equity work, accountability refers to the ways in which individuals and communities hold themselves to their goals and actions and acknowledge the values and groups to which they are responsible. To be accountable, one must be visible with a transparent agenda and process. I'll say that again. To be accountable, one must be visible with a transparent agenda and process. Invisibility defies examination. It is, in fact, employed in order to avoid detection and examination. Accountability demands commitment. It might be defined as what kicks, what kicks in when convenience runs out. Accountability requires some sense of urgency in becoming a true stakeholder in the outcome. Accountability can be externally imposed, legal or organizational requirements, or internally applied, moral, relational, faith-based, or recognized as some combination of the two on a continuum from the institutional and organizational level to the individual level. From a relational point of view, accountability is not always doing it right. Sometimes it's really about what happens after it's done wrong. Ally, someone who makes the commitment and effort to recognize their privilege based on gender, class, race, sexual identity, et cetera in work in solidarity with oppressed groups in the struggle for justice. Allies understand that it is in their own interest to end all forms of oppression, even those from which they may benefit in concrete ways. Allies commit to reducing their own complicity or collusion in oppression of those groups and invest in strengthening their own knowledge and awareness of oppression. Remember that oppression equals power plus prejudice. Oppression, the systemic subjugation of one social group by a more powerful social group, 
for the social, economic, and political benefit of the more powerful social group. Rita Hardiman and Bailey Jackson state that oppression exists when the following four conditions are found. The oppressor group has the power to define reality for themselves and others. The target group takes in and internalizes the negative messages about them and end up cooperating with the oppressors, taking, thinking, and acting like them. Genocide, harassment, and discrimination are systemic and institutionalized so that individuals are not necessary to keep it going. And members of both the oppressor and target groups are socialized to play their roles as normal and correct. Remember, oppression equals power plus prejudice and power. I need a break, so I'm gonna give y'all a moment <laughs> to read it on your own. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Racism. Racism equals race prejudice plus social institutional power. Racism equals a system of advantage based on race. Racism equals a system of oppression based on race. Racism equals a white supremacy system. Racism is different from racial prejudice, hatred, or discrimination. Racism involves one group having the power to carry out systemic discrimination through the institutional policies and practices of the society and by shaping the cultural beliefs and values that support those racist policies and practices. Racial equity <clears throat> is, a is a condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicted in a statistical sense how one fares. When we use the term we are thinking about racial equity as one part of racial justice, and thus we also include work to address root causes of inequities, not just their manifestation. This includes elimination of policies, practices, attitudes, and cultural messages that reinforce differential outcomes by race or fail to eliminate them. And then I'll let you all read racial justice and white supremacy. All right, so we'll just take a quick moment. I'm going to um, stop share for a second. And does anything uh, rise up for anyone? Any thoughts when you're learning about those definitions or even if you just put in the chat something that you learned, um, something that was a little bit more thought provoking, even something that you don't agree with. Um, and we'll just have two or three people share if you would like to, or you can just use the chat. And you can just unmute yourself, we'll kind of popcorn it. I don't need, no one has nothing to share. Um, I do, Venus Rick. Hi, Hi Venus, go Hi. ahead. I appreciate that the definition for racism included white 
whiteness and white supremacy. Um, I've seen it at least in this area and doing this work where folks um, discuss it as, as if it's an interchange between people of color or BIPOC people and white people um, and leaving out the fact that racism, at least in the United States, um, is from the institution of slavery and also pushing native folks out of this land, right? And that is left out oftentimes. And so I appreciate um, that frame. Oh, thank you, Venus. Anyone else? Carol says, going beyond individual attitudes to systemic change. And Wendy says, going beyond just equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace. Thank you all. Anyone else? All right. Um, and, and also, Venus, I appreciate you. I, you know, we go into these things very quickly, but I also want to ground uh, myself again, um, kind of jump right into the presentation and just take a moment to uh, acknowledge that where I am situated is on Piscataway land, which is also to you all considered Baltimore. So I live in Baltimore City and I'm a native Lancastrian. And oftentimes folks ask, well, why do we acknowledge the indigenous land? And so it's important for us to acknowledge the land that has nourished us, acknowledge the people who have come before, the knowledge the, and understanding that how colonialism and imperialism and settler colonialism has caused harm and oppression. And so we are um, acknowledging that which has come before, those folks who are still the keepers of the land and who preserve the land and pray over the land, even when we're not acknowledging their existence. Okay. I have a quick question for you. So I, I just put something in the chat. I, I see people use the term racism as a blanket terminology when they're talking about discrimination, prejudice, and racism, where to me there are three separate definitions that happen three very distinctly and different ways, not to say that they can't all work together, but I have I, I really like your definitions, but I'm curious how you see the perspective of those terms and how they're used and intertwined and how you feel they work together or don't work together in conversations. Yeah. So a lot of times we hear that other folks can be racist outside of the white dominant culture. And that's just not the case because racism is situated on power. Right. And I know y'all, some of y'all done read this book. I know. And I know Ibram. And Ibram has told some of y'all that black folks can be racist and so on and so forth. No, that is not the case. There is a socialization that we all, so we have to understand how white supremacy racism in its global context has perpetuated harm. And that means power. So one can be socialized to have internalized racism, which then they then might perpetuate that, that harm back. That doesn't mean that they're racist because a black person cannot be racist. A Latinx person cannot be racist. They can be discriminating, they can be discriminatory, they can be prejudiced, but they cannot be racist. There's a whole body of information and insight that I'm happy um, to, to share that isn't just me. When we're thinking about critical race theory, when we're understanding what has come before, and we also have to ask the question, when there are so many people who've been writing about racism, how all of a sudden does one singular person get millions of dollars to become the leader around talking about anti-racism? And that doesn't mean that what Ibram is presenting is I'm not, is not fully, you take, it's, it's acknowledging the both and. It is acknowledging that there are moments in time that we're going to read something, and this is part of the discourse. And it's for us to theorize and think through and delve deeper and not just take one singular book as the way, the truth, and the light. Um, and so again, black folks, folks of color, folks who have constantly been oppressed because not having the power from a globalization standpoint are not racist, but they can be discriminatory against someone's race, their religion, their class, and so on and so forth. And they can also be prejudiced against it where they then perpetuate that harm. And so it's also important to acknowledge intersectionality and how all of these things manifest itself. Um, and so understanding class, understanding um, 
uh, LGBTQI plus, and also how that's situated if you are an Asian LGBTQI plus. Also, if you're a trans uh, Black woman, you're going to face a different level of oppression. Um, and so it's understanding and acknowledging that. Um, and thank you. I think it was Wendy she put in the uh, in the chat, yes, if you ever want to figure or find out the indigenous land that you were on, um, you can go to native-land.ca, you type in your zip code, um, but it's also a very important way to acknowledge um, the land in which we stand on. Yeah, and so you're asked, oh, Bonnie, and how do Asian and Hispanic people fit in here? Sorry, I couldn't find a link to join us. Okay, no problem. Um, and Bonnie, I'm guessing you're asking, in regards to racism, are you asking how do Asian and Hispanic folks? Okay, oh, okay, hi, Bonnie, I see you at the bottom of my screen. <laughs> um, and so you have to think about anti-Blackness. We have, to, and we'll also get to this. So if you give me a moment, we're gonna kind of go into the racism later on that will, I hope, kind of help contextualize all of this as well. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay. Oh, Zoom. All right. All right, so moving along. And so uh, I call him Baba Chokwe. Um, Baba Chokwe, so Baba also means um, dad or father, and you use it also in the context of um, if we're thinking of tree, the, one of the good indigenous Ghanaian languages, it is acknowledging an elder. And so I personally knew Baba Chokwe and then Ma Keru is um, a metanetra. So when we talk about hieroglyphs, there's an actual language and it's called metanetra. And Ma Keru is someone who has done good work. Um, and so uh, Baba Chokwe says, Change does not come on thoughts alone because we have a revolutionary ideology and give speeches on it. It comes, become, it comes because you can change the material conditions of people and get people to assist in the change, be the mainstay in the change in their conditions. Um, Baba uh, Chokwe Lumumba, he was a former mayor of um, Jackson, Mississippi, and he had transitioned a few years into being the mayor. And now, and then uh, post him passing away, there was a re-election where they then um, elected his son, um, who was now Chokwe Antar Lumumba, who is currently the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. And so here, what you're really seeing uh, Chokwe say is, we can have all the conversations that we want and we can talk about being equitable. We can talk and talk and talk, but what's most important is that we have to change the material conditions of a people, that we have to get the people to assist in that change and that they have to be the mainstay in the change in their conditions. Folks within community are experts in the conditions. They are the experts in what it is that they wanna see. If anything, we are working to figure out how do we leverage the support in a way that allows us to change and transform the material conditions. I don't wanna hear, and I'm gonna put the I, most folks don't wanna hear, but I don't always wanna hear, we're working to become more equitable. What does that mean? How do we do that work? When there are still people who are homeless, there are still people who are without, there are still people who do not have um, jobs, there are still schools that do not have heat or air conditioner, there are still students who do not have access to Wi-Fi, they are sitting outside of their school buildings having access to Wi-Fi in the midst of COVID-19. And the reality is, is that we have the capacity to do it. Because what? When COVID-19 hit, what happened? We all made a shift. We all made the change and the transformation. 
we hopped online, got Zoom accounts, figured out how to create post-it, electronic post-it notes, talk to people, use Google Voice and so on and so forth, create vaccinations, create PPP loans. We did all of these things, but we still haven't yet changed the material conditions. And so we have the ability to do it. We have to ask ourselves, why are we rising to the occasion to actually do that work? And so for a lot of our work requires us having a deeper analysis and knowing that there's um, hidden truths to be uncovered and deeper, me uh, deeper meanings. And so we talk about genealogy. And so it's important for us all to understand genealogy in the context of what has come before. We oftentimes, when we're talking about uh, folks of African de uh, descent, enslaved folks, and I, the reason why I say enslaved is because folks of African descent did not ask to be slaves, so therefore they were enslaved. We talk about enslavement and we look at our books and maybe in high school and maybe there's one page. And that one page around it, it makes it seem as though it's not that bad. But we situate the life of black folks in this country as simply in regards to enslavement, but we never go deeper to ask who were they before enslavement? Who were they connected to? How do we understand their land? How do we understand their culture? How do we place them? How do we situate them? And then equally, how do we place and situate ourselves? And so this is equally by design. So anything after enslavement looks like progress, as opposed to looking at what has come before and how do we resituate a people with their land? How do we resituate a people with their culture? Historiography, we have to question. Historiography is why something was written the way that it was. Who does it benefit? Who told us that history? We are oftentimes told that enslaved Africans were what? Illiterate. They were not illiterate, they just did not speak English. And so miseducation has harmed all of us because the way in how we tell a story, the way in how we have digested a story perpetuates the same harm as opposed to reclaiming and re-remembering what was once before or what has actually happened. And we often think that miseducation has just harmed a particular group of people, it has harmed every single last one of us. And so what, some of us don't find out until college or when we're 30, 40, 50, or 60 that Christopher Columbus didn't find the new world. And imagine a college student, you're 19 years old, and you're like, man, my whole life, I've been told that Christopher Columbus found a new world. And you start to question, do I go along to get along? And when we're talking about the cycle, is social, the cycle of socialization, we begin to see what? That it's enforced. It's enforced to believe that. And how do we see that happen? Through holidays and the negation of indigenous peoples, statues, iconography, the continued perpetuation of who gets uplifted and who gets amplified and how we remember and how we are told a story. And so for all of us, it's to decolonize our work. It's for us to decolonize how we have understand and to name and begin to reposition folks into their land and allow folks to repatriate back to their land. And how do we do that? By acknowledging and figuring out how do we work collectively to make sure that indigenous peoples do um, have the ability to get their land back and to be able to live safely and without harm. It's for all of us to unlearn and, and to unlearn oppression and relearn new ways of being and becoming. And to understand that within a capitalistic society, there's always going to be an upliftment of scarcity versus abundance. And that scarcity mindset puts us in competition with one another. It makes us believe that there's not enough room for all of us. And how is that uplifted? And how is that upheld? when we don't believe that there's enough positions for us. And it is by design where other folks of color are fighting against each other as opposed to working collaboratively for leadership positions because what? The scarcity is so paramount that they're not able to get the positions and so other folks are holding on and hoarding those positions. And also scarcity and abundance also allows for the tokenization of black and indigenous and other folks of color within institutions as opposed for 
to creating um, more equitable pipelines for folks to be embedded into those organizations and to offer their leadership and their forethought. And so Tony K. Bambara says that not all speed is movement. And Dr. Barbara Love, so think on that, not all speed is movement. And we go to Dr. Barbara Love. And Dr. Barbara Love has what is called developing a liberatory consciousness. And so Dr. Barbara Love says that the awareness, we must start with the awareness, and that's developing the capacity to notice, to give attention to our daily lives, our language, behaviors, and thoughts, making the decision to live our lives from a waking position. And then we have the analysis to not just notice what is going on in the world, but to think about it and theorize on it and find deeper meaning as to why. In action, the participation of each of us provides the best possibility of liberation for any of us. And the accountable allyship, collaboration, trust, and no righteous position. And so when we talk about accountable allyship, and we got the definition on what an ally is and does in regards to actionable operating within solidarity, oftentimes we deem ourselves what allies right in intention with with good intentions we want people to see us as an ally i want black trans folks to see me as an ally but what's most important is, is that black trans folks must have seen me operating with a high level of solidarity and that i have proved myself as working in that solidarity in actionable terms in actionable ways that they have now said yes you are the ally you are an ally and you have worked on behalf of us what we oftentimes like to do is deem ourselves an ally because we don't want accountability. It's easier to go to the protest and hold up the sign. But we don't want to do the actual work. And so it's okay to do the actionable things, but oftentimes we jump right into action without having the awareness or the analysis. And we then perpetuate the same harm. Whether with good intentions or not, it is, I want you to see me, but don't hold me accountable. And we saw this post George Floyd. So many organizations jumped to create a post, but didn't acknowledge their own shortcomings. It was easier to put uh, a black social media square. It was easy to say that we believe black lives matter. That's the easy word but how were you actualizing that in very real ways? How are you being intentional? Because anything outside of that is seemingly performative. We put out our yard signs. And I have family members who said, I see all those yard signs, but none of those neighbors speak to us when we're walking down the street. And so we did those things to safeguard ourselves as opposed to what? Being a living, breathing embodiment of that work. And why was that? Because we went right into action. But what's important is that the awareness, the analysis, the action, and the accountable allyship is that this is cyclical. So you can always go back to it. I know it's written here as like pillars, but you can always go back to that work. You can always say, hey, I jumped into action. How do I go back? How do I go back to be an accountable ally and have and grow the awareness and the analysis? but it's to be cognizant and aware of the ways and how we show up. Any thoughts, questions, or reflections? And you can just unmute yourself if there are. I had a reflection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think this links a lot to what we were talking about with the idea of traditional underrepresentation, right, and traditional oppression. Unfortunately, and I work in education, and um, this is something that's important to me. I'm doing my doctorate in critical race theory. We know that traditional underrepresentation and oppression has happened throughout the years, but unfortunately for organizations, it's become a buzzword. And so instead of recognizing the shortcomings and falling out as a way to empower folks or to actually improve practice, we use it as a buzzword to make ourselves feel better, which is the entire reason why cyclical oppression occurs, because we need to take ourselves out of it. It's not personal to you. It's systematic change that needs to occur. Thank you so much, Tommy. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what Tommy has said. I mean, how do we reposition ourselves? 
we, we think so much about the, the I in a sense of, or how do other people feel, but we're not situating and thinking about how does this continue to oppress those who are continuously oppressed? And we're not thinking in those terms. We're oftentimes just saying, well, I don't really want to hurt that family member. And it's not about it. I would be remiss to say that I didn't. I still have family members who are oppressive, who are homophobic. That doesn't mean that I love them any less. It just means that I hold them accountable to it. And I love them enough to help them understand and to notice it, to cultivate the awareness and the analysis. And that's the work that's most important. This is why relationship and cultivating relationship is important. My granddaddy, bless his soul, said some very oppressive things. That's still my granddaddy and I loved him dearly. But there were things that he said and that he had done that were oppressive. And we all have to admit those things. And that's the work. The work is how do I do the work to reduce harm? How do I do the work to be anti-oppressive every single day? As a parent, I'm thinking, how am I a better parent than the day before? And if we ask the question every single day, how can I be less oppressive than the day before? And be intentional in doing that work. And that's what this is asking for us. It's about the system. As Tommy said, it's about the systems. It's not about the individual. And so you have to think about yourself and how you're showing up, but you have to see that there's a bigger cause beyond just you. And there are people who are hurting because of our failure to rise to the occasion. And so we often tell folks to uh, shh, don't rattle some feathers. Don't make people uncomfortable. But there's something important about the uncomfortability. The amount of times that I have had to be uncomfortable and wrestle with my own shortcomings, my own ways of being toxic and oppressive. And so we all like to talk about the I had a dream Martin Luther King. But this is the other Martin Luther King that folks don't want to talk to you about. And he says, if peace means accepting second class citizenship, I don't want it. If peace means keeping my mouth shut in the midst of injustice and evil, I don't want it. If peace means being complacently adjusted to a deadening status quo, I don't want peace. If peace means a willingness to be exploited economically, dominated politically, humiliated and segregated, I don't want peace. So in a passive nonviolent manner, we must revolt against this peace. And that comes from his speech, When Peace Becomes Obnoxious, March, 1956. Tanae, is, do you have time for a question now? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you're talking about family members who can be oppressive and, you know, there's that bond of love that hopefully exists there. But when you're talking about corporate corporations, right. places you work, places of business, places of education, there's not, let's assume there's not that bond of love there. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. And so when the speaking up becomes, you could lose your job if you do. What, what do you say, do you say call in an outside someone like you? Like what is the best step when you are not someone in control in a system that is oppressive mm -hmm. and that you truly believe can be better, mm -hmm. but maybe the people above you don't want it as much as you do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this goes to the cultivation of community. And so when we have community, so I'll kind of give you a story. Uh, a friend of mine wrote most recently, she is doing, um, she's a PhD student and she's actively working um, to support folks in therapy and social workers. And she has, she's doing equity and practice. And so what she's saying is, is like, I'm giving away 30%, um, only 30% of white folks can join this because I'm centering black and indigenous folks of color. There were folks who, there were white folks who are therapists who also go to the school that she's getting her PhD from, who are alumni, who are now going against her. And very quickly when she received this email and also the fact that the, the white woman went to the university, she cultivated community and she went to her people and said, this is what's happening to me and I need your support. And being able to cultivate community that way, we were all able, all 25 of us were thinking through and strategizing and utilizing our collective gifts, talents, and treasures to think about how do we fortify her while equally making sure that we go, oppress the, go against the oppressive system, which is why we should never do this work 
by ourselves. This is why it requires us to be interdependent and have those folks within our corner. We should, you know, and, and so even when these organizations and institutions are causing harm, we need to have that community back in and we need to find those folks and we need to be fortified in community. And that also means that within community, we're being reciprocated, right? So for her, I'm willing to be there for her because she has been there for us. It's not just always taking and taking and taking without being able to create that level of balance. What do you think about that, Jamie? <laughs> I think I want you on my team always. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we are going to take a moment and I'm gonna break you all off into groups um, and I'll put this in the chat box. And so we're gonna think through, was there a time you jumped right into action without the awareness or any analysis? And then thinking through how can you work more, diligent, more diligently to not cause harm, harm or oppression? And then think through for yourself, what is standing out for you? What is something that you're thinking through for yourself? Um, and so we'll have maybe three groups kind of share out post um, and then everyone else can put into the chat box. So if you give me a moment to stop sharing. All right, so you all will have, let me see, it's 12.56. You will have eight minutes in your group. We're gonna come back within eight minutes. I'll put the stuff in the chat box. For those of you who are not on camera, you can come off of camera if you feel more comfortable. If not, just totally share uh, whatever is most comfortable within to you. All right, y'all, so I will see you in eight minutes. Hello. Hey, how are you? Did anyone write down the questions? No, and um, <laughs> but I think I remember okay. because I love Dr. Barbara Love. So <laughs> okay. I think the first one was, when did we jump right into um, mm -hmm. action without awareness and analysis? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I got you on that first one. <laughs> the other two, I don't remember. <clears throat> we can focus on that first one. Um, I know that for myself, I, I started working for the Alzheimer's Association about four and a half years ago. And when I came into the association here in Pennsylvania, I was the only person that knew how to speak Spanish um, and the, in, in the whole state of Pennsylvania. And I, the lack of um, diversity when it comes to Latinx community um, and the fact that we, are, we haven't done a reach, I was like, this is unacceptable. We need to do something about it. I know that here in Lancaster, I grew up and I, my, my high school was 55% Spanish. I'm like, what is going on? Why are we not servicing our people? And I, it's been four years, but we finally have a connection with SACA. We have things in the works for 2021 to be in that Southeast Lancaster community and show our resources and the things that we're able to provide. And it's been influential because I have not stopped. Every year I'm like, we need to do something, we need to do something. And they're getting tired of hearing me say this many times in different languages too. So um, I think that that was one of the, the things that I just looked at, at what we were working with and the fact that we're not servicing that population. And I didn't stop until our executive director was like, okay, we have to do something about it. Francis is not gonna stop, so. Very brave, Francis. I, I think, Francis, what's also important about, about that is I'm guessing that they didn't notice that they didn't have someone. So it's not just like we, like, I've been in institutions where like, we would really like, so when I worked, in, when I ran Meals on Wheels, we hired two or three people who were Spanish speaking, and then they left the organization. We always knew it was something we were missing when we were missing it. And it was something we'd either hire out translation for or find a partnership. But it's sometimes what boggles my mind is when people aren't even aware of what they're missing and, and the challenge. And I'll say here at United Way, we have four Spanish speaking staff members. They're all in our two on one call center. When I got here, we weren't translating our marketing materials into Spanish because they were over there and they weren't thought of as a resource available to the entire institution. So it was like, oh, we need Spanish speaking call center people. And then we're over here, we're like, we don't have enough money to hire out translation for Spanish. So not seeing how a person 
is their whole self for the institution across the institution, as opposed to being just the specific peg for that specific whole. Absolutely. Right, and thinking about what we talked about is, is the system, right? The system says, if you're socialized in a system that says, the norm is one way, right? So if you think about language, right? The norm is supposed to be English, but we know that that is not the norm. That's the socialized norm, right? More and more folks, especially in Lancaster, because of the, the, the language diversity is tremendous. And for, for a small, not a small, but for a city in central Pennsylvania, right? Language diversity is very important. And so when folks don't see that as a value or they've been socialized to see that anything outside of whiteness is subordinate, right? You don't think that you need to have those resources because you don't think there's value in pulling those people in, right? So Francis, may I use Francis? Um, you were saying you spoke, you speak Spanish. So you came in and said, wait a minute, there's something that is needed here. But think about all, like, had you not be a, have you have not been a Spanish speaker that was in tune to, we actually need some, to pull people in and provide resources, that could have gone on for how much longer in an institution, right? An organization that has been around for a long time. Right, so it's just those pieces, like the system, these folks didn't just come out of the woodwork, it's that you decided that the system wasn't set up and they weren't needed to have that, right? We don't need to be caring about those things. And, and, and maybe not even so much about caring, maybe it's also privilege, you know, the privilege of not having to think about other. And the insidious form of that is, is that when you don't have the diversity slash inclusion, because you can't have diversity without the inclusion, these are the kind of things that happen. Well, or, or, or put another way, you can have diversity without inclusion, but it's not equitable, right? So like you can have a bunch of, and, and my thought on that, for instance, is that like with Francis, um, uh, you know, we have a, a white individual who speaks Spanish, right? So now we've got diversity of in language, but is the institution including people from that community? Or I'm Hispanic, we... actually. I'm Puerto Rican. Okay, sorry. My, <laughs> my last name is, I just married. I married myself. <laughs> my apologies for the assumption. <laughs> um, but, but, so, but so, you know, oftentimes what I see is we hire a white person who speaks Spanish. And then we say we've got that part included. We've, we've diversified our product so we can respond. But we haven't actually included the narrative, the, the community, the perspective. I, that's just my thought um, sometimes on how we end up shortchanging the actual goal by getting part way there. And, and I think that we can always, I'm always trying to remind myself, okay, you did a good thing, now what else? And, and so what's the next, what's the more? And not just stopping at, at the first solution, which I think is to the point of action. In my experience, and I often rush to action, I end up solving like the immediacy of the problem, but maybe not the whole problem. And, and, and I think that it's something that's important to think about. And in Lancaster specifically, like Spanish is an interesting thing because there's not just one Spanish. Like if you are hiring an individual who was taught Spanish in the formal school system, they are speaking a Spain Spanish, not a Puerto Rican Spanish. And so how are you actually looking at that part of the community and making sure that they're heard and not just spoken at. And you're, you're completely correct. I mean, we have so many different nationalities that are coming here. It's not only Puerto Rican. Um, and when I worked for 10,000 Villages, I was a translator for 32 different Spanish communities. So I, you know, I was, Spanish is my first language and I went to, I, I went to school in Puerto Rico. So um, I can translate it, but I had to learn different terminologies. What I say, you know, in my day to day in Spanish as a Puerto Rican is completely different than some someone who is from Mexico, completely different than someone that's from South America and learning that and being willing to be open to learn different cultures. And that was something that when I came into my organization, that wasn't even being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, just at that little small level. And like you said, Kevin, Let's not stop here with Latinx. What about the LGBT community? We're not servicing them correctly. So um, when I, you know, when our office changed into the candy factory, I was like, what are we going to do about this? And, and my boss, who is part of the LGBT community, he's like, absolutely, we need to do more. So just having those voices and having that action makes a change. But if people don't talk about it and they get, you know, 
that cycle of socialization and they just kind of let it go. There's no action to it. Something I want to say that I've been hearing from you all is, especially thinking about this liberatory consciousness, right, is that um, Francis, you are Puerto Rican, you speak Spanish, and so you came into an organization where you did the work. So the emotional labor on someone who is a part of right, a group that is marginalized in this country, you decided that it was important and pushed your organization. So the level of emotional labor you had to do for work, right, like you know it's important. And so I think about myself, right, where I have a privilege in that English is my first language here, right? So if I have, I've had friends growing up and people that I've connected with who don't speak English. So I, standing in that place saying, we need to do this, that, and the other, so that person doesn't have to do that emotional labor right? That's also part of the work where we're embodying this and how we're moving about. So you having to do all that extra work you're not paid for, or the people that they hired for Kevin's job to do Spanish in a call center, but then we don't have enough money. Pay those folks extra to come do the work that you need to do. They're already in your organization. How are you using folks' resources and not seeing them as beneath you, right? Or how are you stepping in um, and using your privilege, even if you are a part, there's, even if you're a part of a, a press group, there's probably another identity where you have privilege in, right? How and are you- Gender play, like gender, add on top gender, yes. gender identity perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was just thinking about that emotional labor piece in these spaces and who, who's doing the work to make it go forward. Are they the same people that are being oppressed? Just so you all know, we need a speaker for our group and we're going back in one second. Oh, I see more people off the screen. On camera. <laughs> All right. So which group would like to share first? We'll do three groups just because to be cognizant of time. Uh, who want to go? You go ahead. Whatever blesses your heart to say and do. Fran nominated me to share for our group and <laughs> I, I do what Fran says. <laughs> Uh, we talked, Fran shared about the importance of actually having conversations rather than doing surveys. So for organizations that want to help the community instead of either deciding on their own, and Fran, please step in and correct me if I'm wrong, but either whether they think they know what the community needs or they send out a survey to find out what the community needs is very different than bringing people in need into the conversation. Uh, I shared about, uh, you know, my concerns about performative allyship versus actual allyship. Um, Heather, I think I'm getting Heather's name right, shared about um, being new to this kind of work and really being someone who's like a go-getter and who often thinks she knows what a solution, what solution is needed, but has learned in actually doing the work that it's often different from what's what she thought in her head would work. Um, and Celeste shared that she is also new and that to this work and that they've started a group uh, in her church for advocacy and she was here to learn. So I think, I think that was everyone's. I hope I represented us properly. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Anyone else? Two more groups. Our group didn't choose a person, but if they're okay, I can be our person if, unless someone wants to fight me for it. <laughs> That's what we're here for this is a peaceful environment. Um, so we talked about uh, we. I'm just going to give the kind of the last part of what we talked about. Like the uh, we were talking about you know diversifying organizations and the ways in which the policies and practices aren't necessarily right when you diversify it doesn't necessarily keep people in the fold or how your organization isn't serving their populations well. So we talked about adding right language. So. A person in our group, Francis, was talking about the experience of Spanish speaking services um, in her organization. And being a Spanish speaker, she brought that to the forefront. And so we were talking about the importance of that, um, but then also who's doing that emotional labor, right? So if Francis is a member of a Spanish speaking community or is uh, Latinx, but then sees that as the value, what does the organization see as value, right? And so we were talking about that liberatory consciousness that it's not always, it should not just be the work of you coming in, seeing it, you know, if the organization's been around for hundreds of years or 50 years, why haven't they seen this as a need before, right? So we talked about that or the way that organizations see like money, right? So we need Spanish speaking services, but we won't contract out or we won't use our resources within to hire people or to pay them more, promote them, 
to actually provide the services needed, right? So that it's not coming from the people who happen to speak Spanish just by nature of who they are, not their positions, right? You weren't hired to do that work. You were hired to do something else and notice there was a need. So how do you fill that need? Hmm. Thank you, Venus. And if I can expand a little bit, one of the things that also when we're talking about the performative nature of a lot of this, I'm trying to bring this full circle, is we oftentimes look at the folks of color within our organization, and this is also to Kevin's point earlier, of like, oh, the all-knowing person around Black folks, or the all-knowing person around what Puerto Rican and other Latin A, Latinx folks might be facing. And the reality is within this time, even if someone is developing an awareness and analysis, they are not a facilitator. They are not someone who has done the work, like facilitating isn't just like, oh, I have this understanding or I read this one book. It's really about shedding and the healing. And we had lots of organizations jump and want to become DEI focused, but that was never their focus before. And DEI focus or being anti-racist isn't just simply saying, hey, we want to get more black and brown folks to be lawyers, right? It's really about how do we do that deep work to provide real live support for folks to be able to do and become attorneys and lawyers on their own terms, not us trying to dictate what that is. And so we see this happen a lot, where a lot of organizations and this tokenization that happens, we like the folks of color who are most palatable to us, to our liking, who don't challenge us. And sometimes we have to really unearth the ways and how that manifests within our organizations and within our own communities, where we tend to call on the same folks of color who really aren't challenging the status quo, but who are really going along to get along and they might just be you know, a voice. Um, and so we have to be able to differentiate between the two, who's actually doing this work and knowing that we need so many folks in order to do it. It shouldn't just rest on one person's shoulder. Um, uh, is there another group who wants to share? Not. So Aaron says, building on Jamie and Fran's group's comments, I have found there's often a tendency in CBO, which is community-based organization sector, to ignore or dismiss solutions that have organically arisen from the community if they don't fit in the box of how a CBO funder might measure or define it. Mm. That's the thing. Go ahead, Lori. Thank you, Aaron. So our group, um, we spoke about two things in general, but one was about, um, you asked about when you've been driven to action before you've kind of gone through the awareness and the analysis. And I use myself as the example. So um, I was one of those people after George Floyd's death that was obviously disturbed and felt like I needed to do something. And I had, at that point, had been doing a lot of artwork and had been putting together a lot of pieces. Anyway, somebody saw something I did and said, oh, you should make that into a yard sign, speaking of yard signs. So I was the one that did a Black Lives Matter yard sign that I sold to folks all over Lancaster County and then donated the money to Equal Justice Initiative and TCP. I wanted to do a local, whatever. So to your point, those people, myself included, I didn't go through the steps. I'm, I was very happy to hear that you talked about how you can go back because I've since then been reading and trying to educate myself and attending these types of things. Um, but to your point, there were a lot of people who had these yard signs up that didn't really understand, was, they really weren't aware of everything they needed to be. Hopefully people can go back to the awareness, build the awareness and analysis and really understand that and become a true ally and not just a throw you know, that out. Um, so we talked about that. And then we also talked about, um, you know, sometimes it's just hard to, there's not, you feel like there's no time for that reflection. So it does take time. It takes a lot of time for someone who's grown up with this white privilege to really go to really understand and be able to absorb it all it's taking a you know me some a lot of time um and i also talked about that there is not one perspective of someone who is of color um and that can be confusing to your point reading different books and reading different things and trying to 
understand it all. Just like there's not one white perspective. I'm Jewish. There's not one Jewish perspective. Um, so, you know, just how difficult it can be in the time that it takes to really reflect and understand it. Yeah, thank you, Lori. You know, grace is an important thing. And there, there's a difference between having grace for people who are intentional about saying, I don't know a thing and I'm trying to work through it. And also the acknowledgement that someone is working through it even if they can't admit it. But this, I, this, this holding on to the egoic self of I'm all knowing to not be humble, to not have any level of humility and thinking like, oh, I got all the answers. You know, I didn't read that book. That book done told me that I am actively doing this work and I ordered my books. I got my five books. And, but yet not delving deeper beyond those things. And that's really what it's asking of all of us to do of how do we delve more deeply? How do we become more reflective? And how do we take the personal out of it? So it is personal to the individual, but when others are sharing their experiences, we tend to think, well, I'm not, that's not me. A friend of mine, Mackenzie Mack said, you know, if some of the white folks would stop saying, you know, I don't have a racist bone in my body as opposed to the racism is in your head. And so the reality is, is that we all are conditioned to do it. There's the internalization, there's a socialization of it, but we have to be able to admit as opposed to simply saying, you know, this is the only way I have um, automatically have done this work. All right, y'all, we got 14 minutes. And so I will say this, if Tracy, Fran, y'all and Aaron, y'all can tell me, I'm willing to stay on for folks who want to, who have any questions post, but we'll go through um, this presentation and then I'll stay on for the other folks. And then we'll talk about how to stay in communication with you all. So, all right. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Okay, then. All right. So, this is my cousin pastor, the Reverend Dr. Heber Brown the 3rd of the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. And Heber says, Reverend Dr. Heber says, "Be weary of those who are more concerned about the expression of your pain than they are the, of the conditions of your suffering." That's my pastor who said that. And so what do we see here? There are often folks who are upset at the way and how black and indigenous folks of color share and talk about their suffering and how they express it. But they're not concerned about the conditions that have created it. And so we oftentimes talk about violence, right? So one, we'll, people say black on black crime. Well, one, black on black crime is a myth. Statistically proven, it has already proven that white men are killing white men more than black folks. But when we're talking about socialization and the internalization of harm and oppression, we tend to harm those who are closest to us as opposed to fighting against the systems and structures. So this is when people take away your power. You feel powerless and you try to exude power in other ways. Then we're also acknowledging the violence that begets the violence. It is violent that people are homeless. It is violent that people are unemployed. It is violent that people do not have health care. It is violent that schools are inequitable and do not have books and resources. It is violent that we put children in schools with inadequate educators who do not love or care for them. So we never oftentimes talk about the violence that begets the violence. We like to talk about the outcomes, but we never like to talk about the root causes. And so when people are rising up, we tend to say, shh, don't say too much. Don't, 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 ru don't rustle any feathers. Don't protest. Don't demand for what it is that you want. Just wait a little longer. So imagine someone came into your home and took over your house, took away your children and took away all of your privileges. Would you be telling other folks to hold on a minute? Oh, just wait till next year. Or oh, we'll work on that policy agenda in five years if you can just hold on. But the time is now. 
The time is now for all of us to rise to the occasion and to remember what Adrian Marie Brown said. It, it, it starts with the small. It doesn't have to be these big grandiose things, but it's every day actively working to work towards change and transformation and ultimately liberation. And so liberation is situated on the collective. Everyone, it is Ubuntu. I am because you are, I am because we are, because we are, therefore I am. It is that I'm tied to you, you are tied to me, and I'm actively working towards that. And so uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, he situated around everything about him, particularly, I'll send these resources as well, around beloved community which is the acknowledgement that no one is disposable. Nobody. The worst of the worst of us. I have worked on abolition of prisons. I have worked on abolition of the death penalty and folks have been angry at me because of that. I do not believe in the death penalty. And there's a historical reason for that and also a spiritual reason for that. The historical reason that we're looking at the connection to death penalty is a connection to lynching. And when we have provided space and place to continue and we never acknowledge, what if people had all that they needed? How would we all fare in society? If there was no oppression, if there was no harm, if there was no racism, if there were no phobias and isms and kisms, how would people be if we all had what we need to live a life abundantly? And beloved community requires that we have radical imagination. Nothing is keeping us from doing the thing. And so we have to envision it. I mean, if we really think about children, they have all the imagination if we don't kill their imagination, but children have all the imagination in the world. And if we just sit and watch and how they play, and if we equally do the same thing, nothing is holding us back to be able to build a world anew. And that we have to have the belief that there's otherwise possibilities. What we have been conditioned to see the world and society as the way that it is, isn't what we have to accept. We have the collective body of people through relationship cultivation, through love, through intentionality, have the ability to create a world anew, to build a world anew, and to understand that there are otherwise possibilities to how we can do that. We do not have to accept what has been given to us. And so we talk about the cycle of socialization. And so we'll look at the cycle of liberation. And so at the core is self-love, self-esteem, balance, joy, support, security, and a spiritual base. And so it's waking up. It's the critical incident that creates cognitive dissonance. And that the getting ready is that the empowerment of the self, the introspection, the education, the consciousness raising, that we're gaining inspiration and authenticity, that we're developing analysis and tools, that we're dismantling collusion, privilege, internalized oppression, and that we're reaching out we're move, where there's a movement out of self towards other seeking, ex, to other seeking, experience and exposure, speaking out and naming injustices, taking stands, using tools, exploring and experimenting. And then on the interpersonal, that it change in how we value others and we see the world. And that's how we start building community. We're working with others, people like us for support, people different from us for building coalitions, questioning assumptions, the rules, the roles, and the structures of systems. And then we go to the coalescing of the organizing, the action planning, the lobbying, the fundraising, educating, renaming reality, refusing to collude or take privilege, being a role model and ally, transforming anger and moving into action. And then we start creating change, which is critically transforming institutions and creating new culture influencing. Policy, assumptions, structures, definition, rules, taking leadership, risk, guiding change, healing, and power is shared. And so we're not talking about power over, we're talking about power with. 
And so sometimes power, people get a little concerned about, but how do we all have this equal level of shared power in working towards a thing? And that we're maintaining it. So there's the systemic, there's a change in structures and assumptions, the philosophy, the rules, the roles. And the maintaining is the integrating, spreading hope and inspiration, living our dreams, modeling authenticity, integrity, and wholeness, and taking care of self and others. Any thoughts or reflections on the psychosocialization? All right, we have four minutes for this time. Please know that if you can stay, you can stay. I'll be happy to stay on and think through. Know that I do not ever deem myself an expert at all, um, that we are all collectively and actively working towards this idea that someone is all knowing is just not the case. Um, okay, there's some stuff in the chat box. Let's see. Jamie says, as a writer in the young adult community, I hear a lot of BIPOC writers and LGBTQIA plus writers and Jewish writers and disabled writers talk about how people will only buy books about their struggles and don't want their books about joy. It's oppressive trauma porn and it has to stop. Buy books about black joy from black and brown sellers. Please. Yes, yes. Um, Karen, did you have a hand raised? Oh, hey, Karen. Yes, hi. hi I was good. typing. So um, in your experience, now this is a, probably a really hard thing to answer, but um, like where, where do you find that people get stuck in the cycle, right? That like, you know, all of this is like, we know this, right? And we know that like, yes, it takes time and we know all the answers that we keep getting over and over. And so like, uh, I don't know, I guess for me, I, I I think of Lancaster City maybe being stuck in, in the, oh, I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> What's your opinion? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that it's so loaded, yeah. but I do feel like most folks get stuck when, because our livelihood is connected to it, right? right? And so if I might, if I go against or I think a different way, our jobs are threatened, which is connected to how we live our lives, which is connected to how we provide for our families, which is connected to so many things. And I think it's the acknowledgement and the wrestling with how do I shift mm -hmm. and also folks taking it so personally yeah. in the sense of that they think that it's so much about them as opposed to this larger system in this structure. And so just being situated of like, you have an attack on me. I mean, the reality is, is that there's always going to be some level of uncomfortability with all of this for all of us. Yep. And it is when folks make it so much more about themselves, as opposed to how can they actively work um, to make the change and transformation. And folks who just want to still uphold the same power. Well, sure. And, and that's the thing, and not wanting to confront that of like, you're talking, you know, for them, it's like, you're coming after my millions of dollars. And it's like, well, can you share? And also asking the question of where did that come from in the first place? Like the wealth of this country isn't, is come from enslavement. And so when you have millionaires and billionaires, and then also, you know, we're even talking about globalization and how you have now outsourced, it is situated first on enslavement. And so when you have this acknowledgement of the money that you have received that isn't really about your hard work, 
but it's really about the hard work of others, it repositions how you think. It should, or it should reposition how you think and how that you can have power with people and shared resources. Right. I, I agree with what Karen said, and you too, Tanya. Um, it, it is, when you put, when you see this, the chart on the screen, it looks so easy to go mm -hmm. from one to the other and just make that circle. You know, in my family, I have just about everybody <laughs> in the different groups. And I think that really makes a point when you're out and about with some of your family. And um, I think you're just making a point right there simply by accepting them for who they are and where they come from. We're not necessarily biological, biologically related, but, um, and then put that in, I'm, I'm living in a small town, so that's even worse yet. I mean, it's, it's really difficult sometimes when you live in a small town and there's all those people that think this is the way things should be, like it used to be you know, 40, 50 years ago even. And it's not that way anymore. Yeah, and it's also about, like if we're centering being anti-oppressive, it's how do we have the both and? I think we often think that it's either or. And there is oppression within, I'm a Christian, in the sense of my cultivation of belief, it's my practice of, of faith. While eat and the both and is that I also practice hoodoo and I also practice ife. And so all of these practices help fortify how I do my work and how I try to live my life. They are practices. They are what help guide me. And there is oppression and oppressive practices within that. When I'm thinking about the Almina dungeons in Ghana, folks call it the Almina castles. Our tour guide showed us the church situated in the dungeons. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you all for joining. Um, and there's a church central in the middle. And what they showed us was there will be days that there were so many enslaved Africans who were literally held bondage and um, held in shackles. And these folks who lived at the dungeons would walk over them into the church and would also say that it was their God destined to enslave these folks for the benefit of themselves. And so that's a history within Christianity that all religions have to, have to look at. But equally, how can I be fortified and how I have come to understand my Christianity and have a more liberatory practice within it. How do I think through Christianity in anew? How do I get more connected to the text? How do I understand? And so there's so much of that that we're not willing to do because we think that everything is either or as opposed to both and. And so we can find those otherwise possibilities because there, it is there. We just have to be willing. It doesn't take away from anything. It allows us all to provide space and place to do the work, to think differently, um, to be intentional, and to build that world anew through otherwise possibilities. Anyone? One of the things that I, I've often struggled with and continue to struggle with, and I think it kind of um, builds on what Chris put in the chat, um, is you know is is understanding the importance of trying to use the privilege that you know I have of access of circumstance of whatever um, to to work on white people in the best ways that I can, um, but to do so in a way that doesn't create false equivalency um, because I mean like you know you, you want to be able to push people um, and and do things, you know, and get them to think and expose to new ideas and hopefully um, question and unlearn some of these things like we're all trying to do. But like how I often struggle with like having to do that in ways that feel really icky to me in ways that like, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you draw effective lines while not, while still being able to reach to some folks? Because they're, because it's, it's not to say that like, 
things haven't been worse than they are now, of course. Um, and I would argue that like institutional power is probably the weakest it's ever been, even though it feels stronger sometimes. Um, but like the the pathways, the pathways to get to those folks, I feel like is more tenuous than it's ever been. So like, how do you do that without sacrificing, um, you know, compromising on things like Black Lives Matter, things on, you know, very, very like hair trigger things for folks that like sometimes can instantly shut a conversation down when it's like, I'm not actually going to negotiate on that. So well, where do we go from here? Yeah, thank you, Aaron, and also for uplifting Chris. Chris, I apologize. I all the messages in the chat <laughs> didn't see. Do you want to expand a little bit on what you're saying, or you just want what's in the chat? Feel free. That is very connected to what I was raising uh, too, and I think the um, the question of coming out with a position statement mm -hmm. uh, around the George Floyd around the death of George Floyd and, and, and others this past year, what like brought a lot of that to the fore in a really helpful way, but also then it, um, the question of like, well, what's, what is the, like we we don't put out statements for anything usually um, as an organization, you know, we're a mediation organization, not a, an advocacy organization. So yeah. then it brought up a lot of other questions about like, are we, cutting off some potential constituency um, by doing this. Um, it's a written form of, of a statement. It's not a dialogue that we're, you know, mm -hmm. for example, that we're feeling compelled to put out there. Um, perhaps it can be part of a dialogue, but again, does it cut off some dialogue too? Mm -hmm. So uh, so I think there are a lot of, and, and this has everything to do with the medium of communication, not, you know, if everything was face to face, we would, we would be having a very different conversation about it, but we're talking about emails that, and subject lines, you know, and that people just delete rather than engage in any way. Yeah. Afterwards, so. Yeah, you know, on one front, and particularly when you're thinking of um, folks of color, and when you're working with groups, there's an importance that a lot of folks did of saying, I have to show them in a society that feels like it's against them. I have to show them that I'm on their side or that I, I'm wrestling with, with them on this and I'm challenged by it and I'm hurt by it and I want us to do better. That level of intention of like the actionable step isn't a bad step. It's an important step. And you're fortifying those folks of color who feel left out. And you're right, the challenge becomes in these institutions around who gets left out. But we never ask the question of who continuously gets left out. And I mean, I, I think Ben and Jerry's is like, they're just like, look, either y'all hop, either you're on board or you're not. And when you, and so I think what's important is not we have to get situated on our foundational principles and values and even if we're not a hundred percent clear beyond the personalities we have to get clear on the values that fortify our organizations that fortify our community and work actively to do that work other folks like if someone is against the oppression of other people you have to ask yourself the question like if, if i'm thinking of my child and someone is actively working against my child, you can't be within my circle. You cannot watch my child. You cannot, you, you cannot. That doesn't mean that I don't love you at a distance, but I, I can't have you within this immediate being able to touch and be around my child. And I think we have to think about our organizations that way to a certain degree of, you have this large community. And if you are centered on your principles and the values that are anti-oppressive, that are anti-racist, as you're equally working towards being that in real embodiment and terms, folks who don't agree with that, they're going to dwindle off. And the people who feel fortified by that are going to rise up. So or it's like we see businesses who fly the LGBTQI plus and the trans flag and it fortifies and it nourishes and it feels like to a certain degree, I believe a safe haven, but it also knows that some folks are saying, well, I don't really know how that organization is showing up or that business is showing up. 
but how do I give it a try? And so it's something about us really rising to the occasion because the reality is, is that when we're thinking about the dominant culture, the dominant culture wants us always to question ourselves, to think and to constantly think, am I doing the wrong thing even when you're doing the right thing? Because it's situated on coddling the fragility of others as opposed to living out a liberatory practice. And that's what we have to try to work towards. And it's, you're right, it's not easy and it's super hard and it takes time. And that's the thing, like people are like, oh, I'm going to know this in a year or, oh, I'm going to know this after or I'm going to change. No, it's actively doing it every single day. It's actively working, it's actively being intentional about it. And it's thinking through how do you build your practice? How are you um, all inclusive? How are you reducing harm and oppression? And how are you creating a safe space, a, a brave and a bold space for all people to be able to live out their lives and their lives more abundantly? I have an interesting situation here in California. Um, I work at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm a librarian there. Um, it's really tricky because, you know, most people think, oh, California, you know, is so liberal and Santa Cruz is like the hippy dippy center of the world, pretty much. And um, so I've been at the university for 23 years. And this year they did a, um, they did a questionnaire for seven, 700 BIPOC people, um, mostly. Anyway, they, the reactions they got from professors, staff, and faculty um, was chilling. I, I attended an equity inclusion. You know, every university has that little department and you take all those classes and then you're supposed to be, you know, anti-racist automatically because you go to, through two years of training when really the depth part of it is missing. So anyway, out of these 700 people, some, some people were saying, it's super racist at UC Santa Cruz and you guys don't acknowledge it. You don't look at how it's racist. You, you're more interested in um, a percentage of, of black indigenous people of color that you have at your university, yet you really aren't there for them. It's just a number for you guys. And for those of us who are staff who thought we were like also um, somebody, I read that somebody calls liberals like me a uh, polite white racist. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where that comes from, I forget. Um, but it, it was like, now we're forming groups where we're having to really look at our crap, you know, our own stuff. And I wrote in the, in the chat that one book that's helping a group of us who are just, just white, a white group is Me and White Supremacy, where you have to go every day and look at even if you think you're so like liberated and free you know you know how it is you know you've heard all the stereotypes i'm originally from philadelphia by the way but i ended up out, out here um so i just wanted to comment on that because even though we may think we're we're doing all the things right with in equity and diversity then we find out that we're really not and we may be harming the bipoc community more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, then the outright racist, and that's deeply troubling. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you for that, Wendy. I mean, it also goes back to um, the definition of white supremacy, where we tend to think like, oh, it's the KKK, it's, it's all these other groups, but it's really like the covert and overt ways of how things rear its, its head. And so, you know, it's like abolition, and, and abolition in regards to enslavement. Abolition at that time was really about, oh, our morals don't believe that you should be enslaved, but don't start asking for jobs. Don't start asking for human rights. Don't start asking for equal access. And so that's oftentimes like the situation of the more liberal folks who it looks good because it's not as overtly oppressive or harmful and toxic, it's more covert. And it shows up in the way and how people stand in the way of the rights of others, where it's, in, it's embedded in your policies and your procedures and your acknowledgement of how you might be perpetuating harm. And you're right, like, it, it's like, you know, those free flowing folks who are like, oh, I'm one with the wind and lovey dovey and yoga. 
um, you know, connected folks. And yet you're also not decolonizing your yoga practice. You know, if you're thinking about indigenous, um, like the indigenous uh, folks create, uh, South Pacific Asian folks who have cultivated and are fortified through their yoga practice, we're colonial, we're coming in and columbusing and taking over and we're not thinking through those things. But you're right, it is the more covert ways that we have found the harm uh, raise its ugly head as opposed to the overt ways. Um, in addition, I'm sorry, I'm like looking at the chat and coming over here. Um, the, Jamie did also raise a point um, around, we tend to only want to talk about the struggles of black and brown folks, LGBTQI plus folks, disabled folks, but we never want to resituate, which is why historiography is extremely important. Like, I would say this to my son's school, is like, you know, you talking about W.E.B. Du Bois is not anti-racism work. That is resituating history. That is resituating the genius of a person. And, and we tend to think that, like, oh, I'm having our LGBTQI plus assignment. Oh, check, our, there goes our anti-racism or uh, social justice or human rights assignment, as opposed to it being embedded, which is why miseducation has harmed us so deeply because we don't really know the other, the otherwise possibility, the others, and not just the othering and saying like, oh, we're just gonna bring you along, but actually being a living embodiment of, a, of, of bringing folks into the fold of how we understand. Um, and we tend, sometimes see this within colleges. Um, folks are like, oh, I got a particular PhD at this university but you can still be very much miseducated in the particular topic where an undergraduate person may have had amazing professors who help fortify their discourse and, 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 and help them and situate them and understand so many other folks who you don't hear about um, in the general context of institutions. So it isn't just about talking about the struggle, but it's also looking at the joy, you know, looking at reading Toni Morrison, reading Octavia Butler, reading Toni K. Bambara, uh, reading W.E.B. Du Bois, and, and, and so many others, and, and, and reading indigenous folks, but reading about their joy and how they find joy and how they live their lives and live their lives more abundantly, not just about the struggle and the oppression. Hey, I have a question. <clears throat> and I thank you for all of your wisdom and um, you know the way that you've embraced this topic in, in such a um, horrible time in our communities. But in terms of encouragement, what can you say about when it's time to organizations, institutions to go back to the spaces that they're used to working in and this idea that's being thrown around about people, you know, going back to normal, which to me the, the word normal doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, what words of encouragement could you give us about how, you know, we're, we're celebrating this kind of work and, and encouraging um, for organizations to be in forward movement? Mm -hmm. um. I think a few things come to mind. One, it's important to know that this work is not linear. So we tend to think that it's like this straight path and we're building upon it. This work is very cyclical. And so we're always going to be returning time and time and time again. And I think one of the things in regards to this pandemic, I believe it has caused a lot of us to sit down and my hope is it has caused more of us to sit down and be reflective and not everyone has done that. And that's like, that's okay. I mean, it's just human nature. But I think if we situate ourselves in, we have to do this work and that our humanity is dependent on us doing this work and also how we do this work and to be as intentional about it. And I think first it's just confronting the ways in how we have failed to show up. Like, you know, folks who are having the same conversation, like not building upon the conversation, but the same exact conversation five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really about 
us knowing that it isn't these big grandiose things, but it's about our little ripple effects of intention and the willingness to do the work of unlearning, relearning, and learning new ways of being and becoming, and to situate ourselves with having radical imagination and to build a world anew and to have otherwise possibilities that another world is possible. And to, to just, and also to extend ourselves grace when we do not know. Um, there is something around call out culture that there's a difference when we're talking about power over that there's a time and a place when you've been so you've been power hoarding and you've been oppressive within a power construct that yes, you need to be called out. But when people make little mistakes and we want to put them on full blast, this is why healing is important. We all need to extend ourselves a moment of grace and to heal ourselves and heal ourselves from our ancestral lineages. And that's okay the ways and how our ancestors may have been oppressive or caused harm and to, to, to realize that we have the ability to make the change and transformation. And that's all that is really asking of us is to do that, I think. But there's so much in that, but you know, man, we almost have like a whole healing session um, that we all just need to shed of, of so much and also shedding of the egoic self. Hey, Karen, did you have your hand up or was that from before? Before. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you had a question. Thanks for seeing that, Kim. Sure. <laughs> Anyone else? So I will, I didn't have a, a last page with all of my information, but um, I love having conversations and delving deeper with folks. Um, I'll put my information in the chat. Uh, for you all. And then I'm believing Fran and Tracy and Aaron and Kim that we'll just send all this out. And I'll also do some, uh, some resources and book lists. And um, you all can have these slides to utilize um, for yourself. And just to continue the conversation, I'm always open to thinking through relationship building and cultivation so that we continue to do this work. And so um, I appreciate you all for joining me, thinking through things, um, and challenging me as well. And so I hope you all have a good day and know that I'm always here um, to talk with you all and, and think through things. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tanae. Thanks, Tanae. Thank you.